Welcome to 17th Century Tales from Cavalier Newark, recorded from a secret Nottingham Roundhead location. Episode 2, Three Brothers. In the last episode, I talked about how during the Civil War, Newark was largely unified in its support of King Charles I. But there was one notable exception. I'm talking about the Hacker family. The Hackers were a prominent East Bridgeford family. There was Francis Hacker Sr. and his wife, Margaret Hacker, and they had six children. Three of those children were sons who were of fighting age when the Civil War broke out. Two of the sons fought for the king. One of the sons fought for Parliament. The two sons that fought for the king were called Thomas Hacker and Roland Hacker. The son that fought for Parliament was called Francis Hacker after his father. So for the sake of clarity and convenience, whenever I refer to Francis Hacker from this point on, I'm always going to be talking about the son rather than the father. We don't really know that much about Roland and Thomas Hacker before the war, but we know an awful lot about Francis, so let's start with him. Francis Hacker was born in the year 1618. He was the oldest son. He married a lady called Isabel Brunts. Well, I say lady. Francis Hacker was 14 when he married Isabel Brunts. I'm not not sure how old she was. So let's conveniently skip over those unsavoury details and talk about something else. Francis and Isabel went on to have three daughters and a son. They lived in Leicestershire in Staffan Hall with a lovely view of the Beaver Valley. Francis Hacker was the village constable. And this included unsavoury duties like collecting King Charles I's controversial ship tax and more agreeable duties like making sure all the beer was properly brewed. Francis Hacker's religion was Presbyterianism. Another detail that we know about Francis Hacker is that by his own admission, he wasn't very good at public speaking. That doesn't really have any bearing on the rest of the story. But when I said I didn't know anything about Thomas or Roland Hacker, that wasn't strictly true. The one thing that we do know about Roland Hacker was that he was a very good swimmer, which does have a bearing later on in the story. When the Civil War began in August 1642, Francis Hacker was made a commander of the militia in Leicestershire. Roland Hacker joined the Royalists at Newark. Well, Thomas Hacker, all we know about Thomas Hacker is that he was killed very early on in the war in a skirmish with roundheads in his hometown of Colston Bassa. So tragically, Thomas Hacker exits the story almost as soon as he enters it. We also know that at some point early on in the war, or maybe even just a little bit before the war, Francis and Roland quarrelled about their decision, and Francis pulled a pistol on his brother. Roland Hacker was made a captain in the King's army. His Civil War career tended to alternate between defending Newark when it was under siege from the Roundhead and attacking Roundhead Nottingham when Newark wasn't under siege. The first time we really hear about Captain Roland Hacker was on the 18th of September 1643 when a Cavalier force occupied Nottingham for a few days. Cavaliers in the East Midlands were doing very well after their incredible victory, expelling the besieging Roundhead soldiers in the first siege of Newark earlier that year. And now that the Roundheads were on the back foot, it was Nottingham's turn to receive a visit from their enemies. The Cavaliers captured the town with relative ease, but they would always have trouble trying to take the castle. And if you couldn't take the castle, then taking the town was a little bit irrelevant. But they managed to stay in Nottingham for five days before they were kicked out by a parliamentarian relief force. But they were an eventful five days. The Cavaliers took prisoners and kept them in pig pens in Nottingham's Market Square. They used the River Trent to transport prisoners and plunder from Nottingham to Newark. They built a fort on Trent Bridge and Roland Hacker was put in charge of the fort. And then there was the grisly incident with the royalist old lady. Nottingham clearly wasn't as unified as Newark, and there were many residents of Nottingham willing to cut deals with the occupying Newark force. One of them is an old lady who wanted to give information to the Cavaliers. Five Cavalier officers gathered in the old lady's house to hear what she had to say and offer her a reward for the information. Unfortunately for the old lady, knowledge of her treachery had reached the governor of Nottingham, particularly troublesome soldier and constant thorn in the side of Newark 
called John Hutchinson. Hutchinson was in Nottingham Castle at the time and trained a cannon on the old lady's house, hoping to kill six enemies for the price of one cannonball, that is, the five cavalier officers, and the one treacherous old lady. John Hutchinson gave the order to fire. The cannonball smashed through the old lady's house, completely missed the five cavalier officers, and hit the old lady square in the face, knocking her head clean off her shoulders. Grizzly. The reason I tell you all this, apart from the fact that it is a fantastically, entertainingly gruesome story in its own right, is that Roland Hacker may well have been one of the five cavalier officers who avoided a near-death experience and observed firsthand the unpleasant demise of an old lady. After a five-day occupation, the cavaliers were forced to leave Nottingham, and Roland Hacker was obliged to abandon his fort and slink back home. But what was Francis Hacker up to? How was his war faring? Not that well, by all accounts. Francis Hacker was taken prisoner at Melton Mowbray on the 27th of November, 1643, by Gervais Lucas, the royalist governor of Beaver Castle at the time. So, what did they do with prisoners in the Civil War? Well, the protocol was, if you were an important prisoner, like Francis Hacker clearly was, you probably didn't stay in prison for very long. Your captors would either ransom you or swap you with another prisoner of equivalent value. And that's what happened. Francis Hacker remained a prisoner until December, when he was exchanged for a Colonel Sands. In February the following year, Roland Hacker was back in Nottingham, trying to retake the fort on Trent Bridge that he had originally been put in charge of. The plan to retake the fort must rank as one of the most bizarre raids in English military history. Roland Hacker was part of a, a raiding party of 12 men who had to dress up in women's clothes, concealing weapons like knives and iron bars and pistols beneath their skirts, and sneak up to the fort on market day, cut the guards' throats, and occupy and hold the fort until a larger force came and tried to retake Nottingham. The plan failed spectacularly. And this wasn't necessarily because Roland Hacker and his cohorts were incapable of pulling off their uh, alluring new look. They never got a chance to. You remember what I was saying a moment ago about how prisoners were treated and the swapsies that went on between Roundheads and Cavaliers? Well, the Cavaliers in Newark had their own prisoner locked away in Newark Castle. The prisoner was from Nottingham. The prisoner was clearly important. Important enough, that is, to be swapped. And the prisoner overheard some Cavaliers indiscreetly discussing a plan to recapture the fort at Trent Bridge using soldiers dressed in women's clothes on market day. Well, on market day, the day of the mission, that prisoner, the prisoner that was kept in Newark Castle, that overheard the thing that he shouldn't have heard, was swapped and sent back to Nottingham. The prisoner went as fast as he could to Nottingham Castle and informed the governor, John Hutchinson. Soldiers were immediately dispatched to intercept Captain Roland Hacker's force on Trent Bridge, and they met them on Trent Bridge, and a bizarre fight ensued with Roundheads dressed in normal military attire fighting cavaliers dressed in women's clothes. There were ten of Roland Hacker's twelve men trapped on the bridge. All of them jumped into the River Trent. Four of them were fished out of the river and immediately made prisoners of the Roundheads. Five of them drowned. One man swam to the shore in safety. He was a captain. We don't know for certain if this was Roland Hacker, but Roland Hacker was there. He was a captain. And, as I mentioned earlier, he was very good at swimming. In May 1645, Francis Hacker was present at Leicester when it was besieged by the royalist general and nephew to King Charles I, Prince Rupert of the Rhine. If you listen to the previous episode of this podcast, Prince Rupert of the Rhine features quite heavily and comes out of it as something of a hero. His conduct at Leicester showed another side to him, a ruthless side. Rupert was responsible for the massacre of many civilians at Leicester. It remains an ugly stain on his reputation to this day. At the siege of Leicester, Francis Hacker was captured by the Cavaliers for the second time. He had a good reputation as a soldier, at least amongst his men. 
Whenever Francis Hacker plundered an enemy, he made sure that he liberally distributed some of that plunder amongst his own soldiers. As a prisoner for the second time, the Cavaliers treated him in a rather unorthodox fashion. Instead of trying to swap him, they offered him a command in the Royalist army. Why did they do this? The most likely motive was the rest of his family. The fact that his brothers were loyal to the king and his family were loyal to the king. Perhaps they figured that they could turn him. Francis Hacker declined their offer. Roland Hacker participated in the second and third sieges of Newark. And we're not sure in which siege it happened, most likely the third siege, but Roland Hacker sustained a terrible injury. He lost his arm or his hand. No one's completely certain. We don't know how Roland Hacker lost his limb. If his arm and hand was broken or shattered, the limb would almost certainly have been amputated by a battlefield surgeon. I'm not going to go into the details of how this was done, but it was quick, unpleasant, and done without anaesthetic. That's all you really need to know. What historians call the First British Civil War ended in May 1646 with the capture of King Charles I in Southwold, the fall of Oxford and the surrender of Newark. Roland Hacker drops out of the story at this point to return later for a very important and pertinent postscript. From this point onward, Francis Hacker takes centre stage. What historians call the Second British Civil War commenced in February 1648. King Charles I was a prisoner of Parliament. Parliament were trying to negotiate with him, get him back on the throne, but with reduced powers. For his money, the king was pretending to negotiate with Parliament, all the while plotting and planning, and from his prison cell managed to start another war. Impressive. In the fighting that followed, Francis Hacker played his part. He was a colonel in the army of Parliament, and on the 5th of July 1648, he took part in the Battle of Willoughby Field on the Nottinghamshire-Leicestershire border. Parliament's enemies during the Battle of Willoughby Field were royalists who'd come from Pontefract Castle and were on their way to liberate Colchester, which was currently under siege. During the battle, Francis Hacker led the left wing and got himself wounded. Now, we don't know the exact nature of the wound. There are a lot of don't knows in the story of the Hacker brothers, but he survived the wound. The Second Civil War didn't last very long. The Royalists were hopelessly outmatched by Cromwell's retooled new model army. The war led directly to the trial of King Charles I. Up to that point, the mood in Parliament had been to negotiate with the king, but since the king could not be trusted, factions in Parliament that were in favour of putting the king on trial and potentially executing him, gained dominance in Parliament, and so the king was put on trial for his life. The trial of King Charles I took place in late January 1649 in London. For the duration of the trial, the king was imprisoned at St James's Palace. A handful of roundhead officers were tasked with overseeing his confinement transportation from St James's Palace to Westminster Hall where the trial was taking place. The soldiers were a certain Colonel Hercules Hunks, a Lieutenant Colonel Fair, a soldier named Matthew Tomlinson and our old friend Colonel Francis Hacker. By all accounts Francis Hacker treated his prisoner with perfect civility and dignity. Famously, the trial did not go the king's way. He was found guilty of treason and murder and tyrannical rule and many other crimes that were laid at his feet by Parliament. The king was sentenced to death by beheading. Francis Hacker was obliged to sign a document called the Warrant of Execution. He signed it. It was his duty. He was a soldier obeying orders. But the decision to execute the king had caused a lot of internal division amongst many prominent roundheads. Some of the judges, including the chief commanding officer of the new model army, Sir Thomas Fairfax, refused to sign the king's death warrant. Francis Hacker's compatriots, Colonel Hercules Hunks and Lieutenant Colonel Fair, and Matthew Tomlinson, either wouldn't or couldn't sign the same document. Francis Hacker was on duty the day the king was executed, and he personally led the king to the scaffold where Charles I was beheaded. 
The next 11 years of British history were unique in that there was no king or queen on the throne. Parliament ruled the kingdom as a republic. And then Oliver Cromwell assumed power and, with the backing of the army, ruled the country as a military dictatorship. The period of history we call the Interregnum. And during the Interregnum, Francis Hacker thrived. He was very much the big man in the East Midlands. He was Member of Parliament for Leicester. He fought the Scots in the Third Civil War. Yes, there was a Third Civil War. He was instrumental in breaking up a royalist spy ring in the East Midlands. He arrested Lord Grey, one of the leaders of a seditious Puritan sect called the Fifth Monarchists. He arrested the founder of the Quaker movement, George Fox, on suspicion of rebellion. He put down a riot in Nottingham. And then, on September the 3rd, 1658, Oliver Cromwell died, and Francis Hacker's world began to unravel. Oliver Cromwell ruled as Lord Protector. When he died, his son Richard Cromwell was made Lord Protector in his stead. But the problem with Richard Cromwell was that he wasn't his father's son. He didn't have the political genius his father had, and was quite frankly incompetent. He was dismissed, and... After 11 years of experimenting with different forms of government, Parliament decided that they sort of preferred what they had before, a king on the throne, but with significantly less power, of course. This led to a series of negotiations between Parliament and the king-in-waiting, Charles II, the firstborn son of the executed monarch, who was living in exile in the Netherlands at the time. Charles II was a more politically astute king than his father and a much better negotiator. Parliament managed to extract from Charles II a promise that he would pardon anybody who'd fought against his father in the Civil War. Charles II agreed, so long as they acknowledged him as their lawful king. While he was willing to pardon anybody who'd taken arms against his father, he was not prepared to forgive those who'd taken part in his father's trial and execution, and demanded their arrest and trial for treason. Parliament conceded to this demand. Arrest warrants were issued, and and anybody who'd taken any direct part in the trial or execution, from a judge to a lawyer to a East Midland soldier who happened to lead the king to the execution, for example, was now a wanted man. Francis Hacker was arrested. When Francis Hacker was arrested, his wife Isabel gave the arresting officers the warrant of execution that Francis Hacker had signed, handing them a crucial piece of evidence. It's unclear why she did this. Maybe she thought that handing them orders, showing that Francis Hacker was a soldier obeying orders, would get him off the hook. Or maybe she didn't like him and wanted to avoid a messy divorce. We'll never know. Of all of the officers of the guard responsible for the imprisonment of Charles I, Francis Hacker was the only one brought to trial for treason. The fact that he was the only officer to sign the warrant of execution didn't help his cause. What further injured his cause was the fact that Matthew Tomlinson and Hercules Hunks gave evidence against him. Francis Hacker was found guilty of treason, and the penalty for treason was severe in the extreme. Not for the likes of Francis Hacker was a quick death by beheading. He wasn't aristocracy. The penalty for your normal, everyday, common or garden, non-aristocratic traitor was to be hanged, drawn and quartered. This meant to be hanged until you were nearly dead and then publicly disemboweled until you were actually dead. Then your head would be cut from your body. In the 17th century, they didn't really bother with the quartering bit of the hanging, drawn and quartering. They weren't barbarians. And your head would be stuck on a spike and displayed publicly. And then your body would be thrown into what was called a common pit and you would be denied Christian burial and your property would be confiscated and given to the crown. Oh, and if you were really lucky, they'd throw in a little bit of castration as well. Francis Hacker was spared the full weight of being hanged, drawn and quartered. There were mitigating circumstances. The mitigating circumstances was the conduct of Francis Hacker's brothers in Nottinghamshire and Newark. One brother had given his life for the cause and another brother had lost his hand, or was it his arm, defending Newark for the king. Francis Hacker's courteous treatment of the king might also have had something to do with it. As a consequence of these factors... Francis Hacker was shown a degree of mercy in his punishment, and that he was hanged, rather than hanged, drawn and quartered. Francis Hacker died on the 19th of October 1660 at Tyburn Gallows. But the relative mercy shown to Francis Hacker by the courts didn't end with the manner of his death. 
Instead of having his dead head chopped off and his body thrown into a common pit, he was given a dignified Christian burial. His lovely Leicestershire home was confiscated and given to James the Duke of York, brother to Charles II and the future James II. And presumably Francis Hacker's wife was kicked out onto the street as a consequence. But at this point, near the very end of the story, Roland Hacker comes back into play. With the Stuart King back on the throne, it was time to reward the faithful. And so for his brave service and the sacrifice of his arm or was at his hand, Roland Hacker was rewarded with Francis Hacker's lovely Leicestershire home. Sort of. He wasn't given the home exactly. He was offered first refusal to buy it by the Duke of York at a price of the Duke's choosing. The Duke seriously fleeced him on the deal, it has to be said. But at least the house stayed in the Hacker family. And that was the end of a life of drama for Roland Hacker, who lived out the rest of his life in presumably blissful uneventfulness, dying in the year 1674. Thank you for listening to episode two of 17th Century Tales from Cavalier Newark, written and presented by Adam Nightingale, and recorded in a secret Nottingham Roundhead location. Episode 3 tells the tale of a most unglamorous spy mission that took place during the third siege of Newark. You really don't want to miss that one. This and other episodes are available from the Learning From Home page on the National Civil War website, which also contains many fantastic resources for occupying yourself at home during these interesting times. Thank you for listening and stay safe.